We are going to see a new way to view the earth. We are joined today by Dr. Thomas Muller. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I was thinking of how we can describe your methodology, and then you told me you've got it on the wall. So maybe we yeah. should preview a bit about your walls and then and then systematically okay. work through your 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 system of travel. Yeah, okay. Uh, about uh, 12 years ago, I came up with the idea that man-made borders are very artificial in terms of experiencing the earth, uh, that uh, perhaps a better way would be to slice the planet up into latitude and longitude uh, sectors or squares or uh, quadrants and uh, try to visit uh, as many of those as possible. So what I came up with is every 10 degrees, so we have 36 of those going around the Earth uh, in terms of uh, longitude. So you have 10 times the 36 slices, so 360 degrees, you complete the whole circle. And then from South Pole to North Pole, you then have every 10 degrees would be so 90 south to 80 south, 80 south to 70 south, all the way up past the equator, then all the way up to uh, to uh, the towards the North Pole. So that would be, uh, uh, you know, like 70 north to 80 north, 80 north to 90 north, and then you're at the North Pole. Uh, and I thought that would probably give people a more physical realistic picture of our planet than going by countries or uh, you know man-made borders so i came up with a map and uh, i'll show that to you right now i'll point it towards the map and you can see what i've done there with the quadrants or slices So I took a, a map on the, uh, let me see here. Is that yep, good, visible yeah, here? Yeah. And you can see there, well, I chose the, uh, the uh, what do they call that projection? The uh, Winkle triple projection, which is a more realistic shape uh, of picturing the, uh, the, uh, the globe uh, on a flat surface. And then, as you can see, I have marked uh, all the uh, 10 by 10 quadrants that I have visited. There's still quite a number left here for uh, western part of Africa and uh, some part of China and the very top portion of Russia uh, above, above Siberia there. And, uh, of course, Antarctica, that's a whole new... Uh, ball game because getting there is difficult but at least uh, some of them i've covered and uh, uh, but you can see how i've marked it out so mm -hmm. if you go from north to south you get all the different uh, lati uh, latitudinal differences that the planet offers mm. and going from east to west you also get those differences but they're more culturally based because now you're going, if you say, for example, go uh, across from, say, 20 degree or 30 degrees east to west or west to east, you can see that now you're getting through different cultures, Asia, Europe, Southern Europe, uh, North America, United States, and so on. So you get a picture of a sort of how humans live in different parts of the planet going by uh, longitude. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, I started with this map here and I put black dots everywhere uh, where I have been. And uh, they're, they're the smallest dots I could find. So I, I couldn't really, I mean, every dot is roughly uh, 40 miles in diameter. So you can, you can see how quickly you can uh, compact uh, the dots together when you're traveling smaller distances. Fantastic. That's a, a great visualization. And uh, as I understand, you, you originally thought about the, 
you know, the, the basic strips and it was uh, uh, one of our <laughs> Uh, very uh, addicted country collectors, Harry Mercedes, who encouraged you to yeah. make like, all of these grids. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, so what he suggested is don't just go for the 36 uh, latitudes and then the the, fifth, uh, the 18 longitude. Why don't we just do every single one of those uh, sectors or squares or uh, quadrants uh, that are where there is land to stand on? And so uh, that's when uh, Harry Mitsidis took it on and, uh, and posted it as kind of another challenge for travelers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've shared the link for uh, Nomad Mania has implemented the, the uh, uh, Know Your Earth challenge so that yeah. can, uh, everybody watching can, can start filling in their, their grid. And I'm. Yeah. I'm that's right. Yeah. I'm fascinated by this view of the world. You've you've covered quite a few of those grids, and a, yeah. I'm wondering, in in terms of you mentioned how you're seeing different cultures or landscape in different ways, and I'm yeah. I'm wondering what are some of the the most uh, varied grid uh, boxes that that you've encountered that say pack the most punch. In terms of latitude or longitude. However, however you define your box. So, which so yeah. one of those boxes that I mean, we would think like, oh, if you want to see museums, you know, New York or Paris, you know, if you, oh, okay. if you want yeah. to see a huge variety of of, yeah. of whatever the world has to offer, human, natural. What are some of the boxes that that have jumped out to you? Yeah, well, obviously the Amazon would be a tremendous challenge because not all parts of the Amazon are accessible. They are, they are, they have roads and highways going through, but uh, you can imagine that being in some among some Brazilian tribe in the Amazon who rarely see uh, white people uh, or any strangers at all, uh, they must live a com completely different. Uh, uh, differently and, and have a very different culture uh, than, for example, those people living in cities or small towns, um, and so on. And you, you know, you can think of the uh, Sahel, the Sahara Desert. You know, going from east to west or west to east, you're going through uh, many different uh, countries there. Uh, but they, you know, segment by segment, you're getting this enormous uh, land of uh, sand and, uh, you know, uh, boiling hot days and then freezing hot, freezing cold uh, nights and so forth, usually cloudless. So you get magnificent views of the stars and so on. And I can imagine people living in such places, they could, they would have, uh, you know, uh, they would have faiths and religions and and beliefs that have to do with those clear heavens. You know, they would find things, uh, you know, in the in the constellations and and you know, be very uh, sort of aware of what's happening uh, in an uh, astronomical sense and uh, the daily life centering around this uh, tremendous extremes of heat and cold. Mm. So uh, you can imagine that. The Bedouin, for example, in in uh, central parts of Saudi Arabia, uh, they have to be, you know, they're very isolated. So, uh, you know, they generally uh, ex escape the the midday sun uh, in their tents, uh, but at night they come out and uh, you know they uh, look after the camels and look after each other and so forth in, in much more. Uh, benign uh, sort of temperatures. Mm. Wonderful. And I want to talk about your varied background. Uh, you you educated in multiple <laughs> continents, uh, multiple careers. You've <laughs> had such a varied experience. I, I've shared just a, a piece of your biography with, with the audience before, but I, I, I continue to envy the the, the the spots of education you had. Can you quickly recount the, all the places you've you've attended school? Yeah, well, uh, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya, and at that time it was a uh, British crown colony. So obviously English was the primary foreign language, 
aside from Swahili, the native language. So yeah, I went uh, to uh, uh, a Kenyan kindergarten and, and year one uh, school and uh, obviously learned English very quickly that way. Uh, my parents were from Czechoslovakia, so uh, it was my, it's basically my native tongue because I spoke it at home right from uh, uh, very early childhood. And so it became kind of like my first language and English my second language. Uh, then we migrated to Iran and uh, I very quickly had to learn uh, Persian because obviously not many Iranians at that time spoke English or other languages except the very educated ones who would send their children off to Europe uh, or to study in the United States. They would come back fluent in French and German and, and English. But the vast majority of Iranians would not have any more than one language uh, with its different dialects, of course. So, yeah, I had to learn Persian very quickly, uh, learn to read and write it as well, uh, but did not actually attend a Persian school. I attended uh, an American school. It was run by the American missionaries, the Presbyterian. Uh, it was a Presbyterian school and uh, it was basically put together for in children who spoke English. Uh, and so you would have all kinds of students coming there, you know, children of army personnel, uh, US army personnel, children of diplomats, mm -hmm. children of engineers that were there for short periods, but they wouldn't want their kids to just uh, sit at home and, and, you know, maybe just read books and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent them to the school because uh, they spoke English. And so uh, they would be there for a few years to several years and then move on with their parents to wherever, uh, generally speaking, the, you know, the parents had a job somewhere else. Uh, and so, yeah, you'd get all kinds of people, technical people, uh, military people, uh, diplomats, uh, consular officials whose children were at that age where they could uh, uh, attend this uh, English uh, school for English speaking children. So uh, Persian came next and then uh, my father sort of encouraged me being uh, multilingual himself. Uh, to learn German and uh, French. Uh, so I did in school. I actually learned French in school, in that same school, the American school in Tehran. Mm -hmm. And uh, German, well, uh, I went to the Goethe Institute and learned German there. So uh, um, that kind of brought up the uh, the five languages. Then, then because I uh, knew Czech, uh, quite well. Uh, it's a Slavic language and so is Russian. And I had a lot of white Russian friends who were, uh, you know, had escaped from the Soviet Union. They were basically uh, the refugees in Iran. And so I had a lot of friends. I would play in the street with them and very soon picked up Russian that way because uh, being a Slavic language, you can make their connection between Czech uh, words and, and Russian words. So, uh, that was kind of a, a nice add-on there. <laughs> That's incredible. And especially I'm thinking that in, in, in my lifetime, my birth coincided with the Iranian revolution. I've, I've traveled yeah. to the country once, but the it, it struck me the, the more senior in years the people I met during my visit, the, the more uh, footloose, I would say, they seemed to be. <laughs> They remembered the times you're describing as a child. <laughs> and you became fluent in Chinese, I understand. I, I did. I studied Chinese at uh, my school in Minneapolis and then lived in China for a decade. Wow. Yeah. But that's that, that's where I've stopped. I've had other, other very faulting uh, uh, attempts <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to learn other languages, and it, it hasn't been something that I absorb and, and haven't focused on to, to my yeah. regret in some ways but, uh, um, you're you're a scholar as well you you've got four four careers and uh, yeah. <laughs> so five languages four careers let's see eight countries on five continents you've you've <laughs> lived you've lived the world and uh, 
uh, some of the research you've done in, in one of these careers around the travel yeah. psychology of baby boomers and seniors. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, uh, talk about how you got into that field of scholarly research and then... Yeah, well, it was a, it was a, a matter of partly of luck because uh, I knew about the existence of the uh, baby boomers in the United States, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. These are, by the way, the only four countries that experienced a post-World War II baby boom. Mm -hmm. uh, many other countries were destroyed uh, through, you know, bombing and, and the war and so forth. So their baby boom was came much later and it was much smaller. But the four countries that basically remained intact uh, after World War II were the US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, uh, because the fighting was done on foreign soil, not, on, not in those countries. So mm -hmm. the baby boom uh, uh, w uh, timing was excellent because the children of the baby boomers, uh, sorry, the parents of the baby boomers were uh, people who had uh, gone through uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the very difficult period uh, during uh, Franklin Roosevelt's time. I forget what, what that was of the Depression, right? And after the Depression. So, yeah, they their uh, life was uh, more constrained. But uh, I guess they must have made the decision that we're going to have as many children as we can afford. And so, yeah, it was ideal ground for creating a, uh, a baby boom. So I happened to uh, get interested in this generation called the baby boomers and realized that, well, if you track the baby boomers, you will definitely see them going through all the different stages of life. Uh, you know, uh, young adulthood, then adulthood, then uh, becoming uh, parents themselves, then going on to, uh, you know, professions, jobs, uh, schooling, university, and so forth, and so on through life. So if you follow them, the natural outcome of this is when they approach retirement, they will want to travel. Uh, and so, yeah, especially when... Uh, you know uh, the fin finances were uh, in good in good shape for them and uh, you know many baby boomers of course were both parents were working so uh, the income was uh, quite uh, adequate for overseas travel so if one tracks those uh, pre-retirement and retirement years uh, of the baby boomers then you will you know you can see a lot of uh, um, travel sort of like where do they go what do they choose which countries do they visit uh, how have they changed the international tourism landscape and so that really got me very interested and i began to study their travel patterns and travel behaviors and travel preferences mm -hmm. and travel choices wow that's incredible and and uh you've probably seen in the past, what six months, a tr tremendous shift in 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 behavior, and and we could safely assume mm -hmm. that many in this cohort are cautious about resumption to travel because of their their age. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, and, yeah, um, when you, exactly. Yeah, when you when you obviously you, you, one ca one cannot travel really too much uh, if one is not healthy. Um, generally speaking, I would say baby boomers have looked after their bodies and are relatively healthy and can travel. But yeah, you're right. I mean, as one gets into the even later stages of life, uh, travel becomes very difficult, if not impossible. Yeah, I was thinking specifically with the, the current coronavirus situation that, yeah, that a, right. lot of, a lot of able-bodied baby boomers, my, my parents, for instance, are... Uh, mm. Uh, they're essential workers in medicine, but they are not taking any 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 uh, risks or trips uh, beyond the yeah. work they need to do. How do you start to envision a, a return to travel and, and the shifts in, in the travel pattern? I mean, broadly, we're seeing people interested in things like recreational vehicles, more local travel, uh, yeah. where, where it seemed like yeah. this was the first American generation that got rick steves got them converted to to going out into the world 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, it's like uh, this COVID pandemic. It's like you know, bottling up uh, these travel desires that you know have to be released eventually. And I can imagine that once. Uh, uh, the virus is under control and people can safely travel, there'd be huge numbers who, you know, having built up these frustrations of not being able to travel overseas will, will then go uh, uh, to the places that they wanted to go and hadn't finished on their, on their uh, bucket list. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, uh, yeah, I think that once this, the main, thing is conquered and the pandemic is well under control and, and no danger of re resurfacing uh, yeah people will get get back to traveling and uh, but you know the nice thing about the covid virus is you get to know your own country better mm -hmm. places that you've always said oh yeah you know i traveled overseas i visited all these countries and places and you know traveled to the north pole and 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 explored greenland and <laughs> Or, uh, you know, New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa, and all these places, but I don't know my country that well. So maybe this is a great chance for them to uh, to travel domestically and rediscover, if you like, or discover uh, some of the places in their own uh, in their own land. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking even those of us that that have lived overseas but but been during a, a work period we probably didn't explore nearly as much i remember talking to you about your your experience living and teaching in japan and there was yeah. much you did and much more that you you wished you had a chance to do yeah that's right yeah i mean yeah there's still uh, chunks of japan i haven't seen and visited but yeah it's a fascinating culture uh, there it's uh, thousands of years old and you know the the Confucian ethic is well ingrained in the Japanese mind, and uh, they're very different people. Yeah, I, I, I was very delighted. They, they come across as a very humble, uh, uh, reserved people, and extremely helpful as well. Yeah, very helpful to people who look lost or strangers who can't find their way around or need help with uh, something. Uh, they're more than willing to, uh, you know, go out of their way to to help uh, visitors. As I understand, you've uh, let's see, you've taught in Canada, Japan. I've I've lost count of of the countries you you've talked about. But speak about your teaching methods and how you how you adapt. Uh, as you said, Japan, the students might be more reserved. Canada, probably not. Yeah, that's right. I would say uh, Canadian. Uh, universities are very similar to American universities. The teaching is very open. Uh, one doesn't expect students to just read the book and that's it, and then sit at an exam and pass the course. Uh, you want to introduce new ideas to them. And so as a lecturer, as a professor, you want to introduce things that aren't in the book and to get their feedback on certain concepts that you're trying to cover uh, in that particular course or curriculum. And so uh, that's good. But on the other hand, there are countries where they go much more by the book. I, uh, I never taught in Singapore, but I was told that, you know, you will have your knuckles wrapped if you teach stuff that is not in the textbook. Mm. So much more rote memory kind of learning, uh, which... Uh, uh, does not allow uh, the teacher or professor to expand on things that aren't in the book and give them fresh insights on things that you know they may not have thought of or to get their ideas and incorporate that into uh, a lecture and 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 create discussions hmm. so uh, yeah it's not like this all the time <laughs> you know, also, in Australia, where you, you current live, yeah. and my yeah. trip to Australia, I guess, because of movies like Crocodile Dundee and that, I, yeah. I went in assuming that they were more like Americans, and I've, they in are. my visits, felt, I felt they're more like British. But uh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would say <clears throat> actually more like Americans than British uh, in their learning and teaching 
Um, uh, I would think the same is of New Zealand, although I haven't taught in New Zealand, but it would be very similar. But yeah, Australia and uh, United States and Canada, very similar in the concept of what goes into uh, learning, what is what is involved, what, how do you stretch people's minds, uh, even though uh, it is a specific topic. How do you stretch them to think about, to step back and see the world in a different light in that one semester uh, and hopefully beyond? Mm, fantastic. And, and uh, one of your passions in travel is astronomy. And uh, I've <laughs> recently had this comment that I have to confess I made some very poor efforts to see the comments and didn't succeed. Uh, but you, you had some great <laughs> travel. So so what are the astronomical uh, experiences that, that we should look to travel for? Is it the, the solar? It is, or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, I'm not an eclipse chaser. I do, of course, try and, and, you know, when I have the opportunity to see a, a major event such as an eclipse or such as the transit of Venus, which is an extremely rare event, but mm. perfectly predictable. And mm. so, yeah, I made an extra effort to catch those. Uh, I also, I think it came back from childhood. I remember when I was in grade four in that American school in Tehran, mm. I suddenly uh, fell in love with astronomy. And so uh, I became kind of the, the school, the classroom leader in, in astronomy, I remember my teacher telling the students, you know, if you have any questions in astronomy, astronomy, ask Tommy, he'll he'll tell you, you know. <laughs> so yeah, the solar system, you know, learning the solar system, the planets, the, uh, you know, the different moons of each uh, planet and so forth. And, uh, yeah, and of course, the constellations, you know, in those days, you know, we didn't know anything about black holes and, mm -hmm. and uh, the very distant galaxies. But we certainly knew that there were these clusters of stars called gal galaxies, and there were still mysteries uh, to, to us as humans. So, but it was, yeah, it fascinated me. And whenever, whenever I go, uh, for example, uh, when I went camping, uh, I would choose uh, nights that were moonless so that I could get a great view of the heavens, uh, undisturbed by the light of the moon. So uh, in the Australian outback, it was just superb, you know, so clear away from the city, away from smog and smoke, and even away from uh, humid air. You mm. get the brilliant, uh, clear air. Uh, on a moonless night where you just pick up every single star in our own mm. uh, in our own Milky Way galaxy. I mean, it's just fascinating. Yeah, I still get thrilled about that. And you know, Outback is, is something many have heard of, not necessarily having a, a, def, a, a fixed concept or, or a specific concept yeah. of how you would visit. So and yeah, I, that trip for yourself looks like what and to where? Yeah, I, I would. For those who haven't uh, been to the outback, you know, it's very similar to the the deserts and and uh, uh, plateaus and flat plains of Utah and uh, Wyoming uh, and uh, New Mexico and so forth. You can get the image there that yes, there are not as many cactuses, but there are bushes and uh, short bushes and, and sort of uh, uh, trees that are adapted to that kind of very dry environment where rainfall is, uh, is very sparse. Uh, you know, so you get the gum trees, uh, you, you know, the different uh, species of eucalyptus trees and so on. But uh, it's very much like that. Yeah, it's like going into Wyoming, Utah, you know, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, that sort of thing, environment. Very similar to the outback. And staying barren, you've taken a trip to the North Pole. What is that like? Well, that was uh, <laughs> by a Russian icebreaker uh, for one week. Uh, smashing through the ice, getting to the pole, staying two nights at the pole, and then, uh, of course, coming, uh, you know, off the ship and 
onto the ice and so forth. And then uh, a week back again through that same ice to return to Murmansk, which is uh, the place where, you know, most of these uh, North Pole trips uh, start from and end uh, on a Russian icebreaker. This one happened to be a nuclear powered icebreaker, mm. uh, the Yamal. And uh, yeah, it's amazing power these things have to smash through, you know, two, three meters of solid ice, mm. uh, just pushing it aside and chugging on until it gets to the pole. Mm. So you've mentioned everything but the pole. So is the, is the pole <laughs> the, the least yeah, the exciting is, <laughs> The pole is a white desert. There's absolutely nothing there. In <laughs> fact, you are, you are standing on frozen ocean. There's nothing. It's not like Antarctica. You know, there's no mountains. It's just flat, flat and white all the way to the horizon as far as the eye can see. Mm. So, uh, you know, basically, except possibly for, uh, you know, you might be lucky and see polar bears uh, and, uh, and occasionally seals, but it's basically very boring. It's just a sheet of white, uh, you know, sitting on top, a cake of ice on top of the uh, Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Now you go to Antarctica and it's a completely different experience. You have all the wildlife there. There are no land-based animals in Antarctica. They all live in the sea and they come uh, to, uh, to have their young and to hatch their young uh, ashore. Uh, onto uh, Antarctic land. But once that's finished, they go back into the sea and they stay there, uh, you know, most of their lives until it's time to mate and, uh, and have uh, the next generation. So then they come on land for that. But uh, completely different. You have the very high Antarctic mountains. You have amazing optical uh, effects because the air is so dry and clear. The mountains seem like they're only 100 miles away and they could be 600 miles away. Yeah. You know, it brings everything closer. So, yeah, the mountains, the, the wildlife, uh, the ocean, of course, uh, the glaciers, uh, you know, the carving, you know, the carving of the glaciers when they crash into the ocean and all that part of, you don't see that at the North Pole. I just love love hearing your words wash over me as you describe a landscape. I, <laughs> I don't know which, which landscape can I pick to have you describe another uh, of the, the Earth's wonderful landscapes in your inimitable way. Well, you know, the waterfalls, of course, the big waterfalls like Iguazu waterfalls, <clears throat> Victoria Falls, you know, even Niagara is very impressive, Niagara Falls. Uh, not many people will get to see uh, Angel Falls because it's tucked away in the Venezuelan jungle. And right now, Venezuela's got political problems, so difficult for visitors to come there and get it, but not impossible. Uh, but yeah, I think waterfalls are amazing things. In, <clears throat> in Australia, we have horizontal waterfalls. This is where rivers come between two uh, necks of land and squeeze through in a horizontal way so that the boat taking you there uh, or the small ship taking you there has to go up the waterfall, but in a horizontal motion. So mm -hmm. you're going against the current of this huge waterfall coming through. So yeah, horizontal falls, amazing. <laughs> oh, wow, incredible. And uh, Canadian far north you've traveled to as well. It fascinates me. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. The Inuit have their own culture, uh, their own food, their own way of hunting, uh, you know, everything. They are allowed. Uh, we uh, generally speaking, without a permit, you're not allowed to hunt any animals. But the Inuit are permitted that because it's part of their lifestyle. So uh, they are allowed, for example, to kill seal uh, for the food, uh, to hunt walruses, uh, occasionally, uh, you know, uh, have to shoot polar bears because they may be a danger to the small community or village. 
Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, it's a, an amazing lifestyle. I mean, these people for thousands of years, I would say, uh, have been adapting to a very harsh environment where half the year you're in darkness and half the year you have, you know, 24 hours daylight. Uh, so you can imagine the, uh, uh, the need for sheltering and traveling uh, by sled and, uh, you know, by uh, dog teams and so forth uh, to get from A to B for the, uh, for the Inuit. Mm. Wow. And, and across Russia by train. You've had so many of these experiences that I can feel well-traveled in some way, but so many I want to do. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing thing that you start, I started in Vladivostok and went all the way to Moscow, but not in all one go. Uh, first you go north uh, and then from there you switch trains and you go to a different one called uh, uh, the, the Baikalo Amurskaya Magistral, B-A-M, uh, mm -hmm. the Baikal Amur uh, main, main Line, uh, which is shortened to B-A-M for the, uh, by the Russians. And then from there you, you get to Irkutsk. Mm. Uh, and from Irkutsk, you join then the Trans-Siberian, which mm. has also started from Vladivostok, but I wanted to try these other railway lines as well. And then from there onwards, it's just amazing. Forest tundra, forest tundra, forest tundra, and clickety-clack, clickety-clack, non-stop. I mean, you're going six days on that train. And mm. you make many friends, of course. In the compartments, you meet Russians, you meet visitors you meet foreigners traveling mm -hmm. uh, and so forth it's just an amazing adventure yeah really <laughs> i was lucky that i had a bit of russian uh, under my belt so that i could communicate with some of these people who don't know anything but russian and they would invite me to you know share their raw fish with them and uh, vodka and so forth yeah i remember taking a train in azerbaijan and they uh they would have a whole sugar cube in their mouth and then just slowly <laughs> sip the sugar through that. They slip yeah. the tea through the sugar. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they sip the tree. They, they sip the tea through a, a cube of sugar to sweeten it as it's going into the mouth. <laughs> Interesting. They do that too in Iran. Oh, do they? Okay, so it is. It does. That would make sense with Azerbaijan, that, that whole <laughs> cultural connection down that way. Yeah, a yeah, little... Uh, a little tea with your sugar. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you, you, you've brightened our day. You've inspired us, and you've given us a, a whole new way to, to see and travel the world whenever we are back out in the yeah. world. Thank you for that's joining right. us today, Thomas. Yeah, my pleasure.